get started. Uh, my name is Martin, and I'm a member of the Bulgarian Java User Group. I first want to thank the organizers, especially Mita, for inviting us here on the conference. So my session will be on modular Java, and I'll also give you an update on the late, latest developments on the Jigsaw project, which is being developed as part of release 9 <coughs> of the JDK platform. So here is the link to our mailing list, so you can also subscribe and you're all welcome to come to an event also. For the next year we'll have a lot of interesting events that we also have planned in our Java user group. So you're all welcome. You can also submit any ideas. So what will this session be about? First, we'll discuss what we'll understand under modularity. What's typically modularity and how is it implemented in the Java language? We'll also discuss how does the OIJ platform sum, solves some of the problems that come with the Java platform in terms of modularity. Then we'll discuss Project Jigsaw and especially what are the latest updates on the project. And at the end we'll have a short discussion on how to actually implement interoperability between Project Jigsaw and OSGI. So, modularity. What do we understand when we talk about modularity? Uh, typically, each Java library itself can be considered as a module. We can have Hibernate, Log4j, a number of other libraries, and each of them can be considered as a separate unit of work. When you develop a project, you just bundle it as a jar file, and you will consider it done. Typically, in order to deal with different types of libraries, you use a build system. This, this could be Ant, this could be Maven. As you know, systems like Maven just download the internet, and you just add all of the modules, or so-called libraries, to your single class path. So, what are actually the benefits of modularization? When you develop separate libraries, you split them into separate modules. So, Typically, each module is more easily tested. This allows also for easier evolution of, si of the system itself, because once you have your system split into modules, you can easily, more easily develop the separate modules or libraries. You can maintain them easily, and so on. So, other benefits of modularity, it also allows you to develop the system in terms of uh, number of teams. So you can split the development of the different libraries in the project among different teams. You can, this also increases maintainability since each module can be maintained by the team that has developed it. This is not always the case, of course. So to illustrate what's actually the problem with these types of modules or libraries in the Java language, we shall look at simple uh, basic problem. We have some applications that we are developing and we depend upon two other libraries. We have library A, which is version 1.0. We also have library B, which is version 1.0 as well. And each of our libraries depends upon library C. So library A depends upon library 1.1 version of library C, and library B depends upon version uh, 1.3 of library C. So this implies the so-called jar help problem. And what this means is that if version 1.1 and version 1.3 of the two libraries are not compatible, well, you get a number of problems. First of all, you can run into uh, exceptions that tell you that, for example, a method is missing from a library. For example, if library 1.1 is included into the class path. As you know, the first library that being loaded in the class path uh, is taken into consideration, the second one is ignored. So this thing actually implies a dependency help. There are different, I've seen a number of ways people resolve this. They're either patching the two libraries so they can be mixed somehow. They either exclude them and use a second library and so on. So different types of solutions to this problem, but none of them is general enough to, to cover all of the use cases of this problem. So Typically, the default mechanism that adds all of the libraries to the class path, apart from uh, raising the jar help problem, gives us a number of 
uh, problems such as lack of dynamicity. Uh, for example, it's difficult to manage the separate modules that are included to the class path. Also, modules are no, not loosely coupled. When you compile against your class path, you comp uh, everything is loaded into memory. So all of the libraries are loaded once you include them to the class path. So typically, the purpose of module systems is to solve exactly these types of problems. And how do they do this? Typically, they allow you to provide versioning of your modules. So in the previous, previous problem that we illustrated, we saw that we don't imply any versioning scheme in the Java platform. So once we load libraries, we do not consider their version. Module systems also allow us to provide mechanism for managing the deployment and management of our modules inside the system itself. Uh, they also allow us to manage the dependencies in a manner similar to how build system manage our dependencies. For example, Maven has a well-defined life cycle for managing the power library. Also, they provide things such as module repositories and configuration management. So, to illustrate how a module system works in Java, we'll look in a particular example. This is uh, the RSGI platform. Has anyone, any one of you done RSGI development? Okay, about five people only. And typically, RSGI has been around for more than, more than 10 years now. And what is it actually? So RSGI is, uh, or so-called Open Service Gateway Initiative, is a specification for the implementation of module systems in the Java platform. It is a de facto standard for implementation of module systems and it also has its own separate JSRs or Java specific re specification requests that define the module systems system in terms of OEGI. So typically what's an OEGI runtime itself? <coughs> an OEGI runtime actually makes use of the Java class loading mechanism in order to be able to provide a container for loading and execution of modules inside the Java runtime. It's based on the OSGI specification and typically many application servers in the Java platform make use of OSGI, for example, for dynamically loading web applications that are being deployed inside the application server. Typically, a module has a very well-defined life cycle in terms of OSGI. We, uh, we first install a module, we can install it from the file system, from a remote repository, and so on. Once our module is installed, it, uh, is, it becomes resolved, which, me which means that uh, the OSJ runtime is able to actually deploy the module inside the runtime. From there, we can actually start the module and make it active, and we can also stop the module. And basically, the meaning of this life cycle is to be able to attach particular types of events uh, during the life cycle of the module itself. And basically the OSGI platform contains a number of units and the specification itself is layered. What do we mean by layered specification? Typically we can implement, each platform can, can implement an OSGI layer and just keep the subsequent layers. For example, we have our operating system running our Java virtual machine and above it, we can have our OSGI, run, OSGI runtime. So the first layer of OSGI is modules, the modules layer. The modules layer defines how do we manage the modules, what the structure of our modules in terms of uh, an OSGI platform. Uh, typically, it also defines how, we do, how do we expose dependencies. So how our module can depend upon other modules and how other modules can depend upon our own module. The second layer is the lifecycle layer that actually implements the logic for starting and stopping of bundles. Then we also then we have the service layer. So the service layer is typically the most loosely coupled mechanism to expose services from an OSGI bundle that can be consumed by other bundles. And for all of these layers of the OSGI specification, we have some security uh, requirements. They are also defined by the OSGI specification. So for example, when we deploy a module inside of an OSJ runtime, it can specify what permissions does it need in order to run in this OSJ runtime. For example, our module needs to open a socket to a website. 
and it can declaratively state that it needs to open the socket. So, and on the left side, we can see what are actually the units uh, that are defined by the OHS specification. We have the so-called bundles, which is a synonym of modules in terms of OHS. We have services and service registry. Uh, we'll look at services in a couple of moments. Uh, we also have a well-defined lifecycle modules and some security requirements that are defined by the specification. So, in the first layer, or the module layer, our bundle can use the so-called export packages. So each module is simply a jar file that specifies in a separate metadata file which packages are visible to the outside world. Typically, when we export some packages, other bundles can import them. And we can import them by specifying a version of the package also. So this is the so-called wire protocol that is implemented in the OSGI platform. And uh, the OSGI runtimes Runtime implements this uh, mechanism by providing the specific class loader, and actually the specific algorithm is described in the OSGI specification. Our modules can also uh, provide services. So the service layer actually is optional, but most of the platforms actually implement it. So the service layer actually tells us that we can expose some services from an, from an OSGI bundle or a module. Once we expose some services, they go into the so-called service re registry, which is a component of the OHI platform. And from there, we can consume them. So we can have other bundles that can request these services from the service registry. So as I already said, this is the most loosely coupled mechanism to implement dependencies between the different modules in an OHI runtime. Here is it, uh, the metadata that describes the module itself. So this is uh, just a plain simple manifest MF file which can contains attributes specific to an OSGI bundle. We have a name of the bundle, in this case it's sample. We have some bundle activator which is mk.jet.javaday.seminar demo activator. This class actually provides lifecycle methods that are triggered upon different state transitions when we install, stop our bundle, or uninstall it, for example. We also have, uh, for example, import and export package. This, the, the, these two actually are provided by the runtime and implement the module layer of OHI. So we say that we want to export the package mk.jug.java day seminar demo utils so that other bundles or other modules can import this package. And we also have import some packages and as you can see in the import package declaration, I also use a version. So this is the wire protocol. I say on, the, uh, on which packages do I bend along with the version. So I can have multiple bundles that export the same package but with different version. And here I can specify, specify upon which version I depend. This version attribute here can, can also be a range of versions upon which my bundle can depend. And it's the responsibility of the class loader to determine which of these versions is available in the platform so my bundle can use it. So the OSGI runtime in terms of its layers is uh, specified in the so-called OSGI core specification. But we also have extensions of the OSGI platform which are provided in the so-called OSGI compendium specification. It provides things such as an HTTP service that allows us to bundle web components inside of our module. It also allows us to implement other types such as, for example, device abstraction layer that allows us to provide abstractions for different types of devices. Typically, the OSGI implementation is implemented uh, for, the for use in different industries and one of them is uh, the Internet of Things. So, at least in my experience, I've worked in a project that makes use extensively of the OSGI core specification along with some of the extensions in order to provide a solution for managing different types of devices that are located in different places. So you can, for example, turn on your oven from work or start your heating controller and so on. So this is in general for OSGI. So the OSGI runtime continues to evolve 
uh, it's reached version 6.0 and the specification con continues to develop and it is there to stay. And we have a short demo just to give you an idea. So I have a pretty basic Eclipse project that has one simple activator class. So this activator class actually implements <laughs> bundle activator which is an interface provided uh, by the OSGI specification and in particular by the implementation of my OSGI container. I also have two lifecycle methods. One start method that's involved, involved once my bundle is started. I also have one stop method which is involved my, once my bundle is stopped. So what, what else? I also have metadata that describes my module. <coughs> If I open up the metadata, I can see that, for example, I also require that this bundle is deployed inside of an OSGI platform that runs version 1.7 or 1.8 of the Java platform. And also, I, I built this bundle with Maven. I have a packaging type of an Eclipse plugin because actually Eclipse plugins are themselves Equinox bundles. The Eclipse runtime, as most of you know, typically provides an implementation of OSGI in terms of the Equinox runtime. And uh, here, for example, I can also specify that this packaging is a bundle. If, for example, I'm using PND tools. So PND tools, in general, is another plugin that allows me to provide configurable metadata for my bundle descriptor or my bundle metadata. Uh, what else? I also built this with Taiho. So Taiho typically is a plugin for Maven that <coughs> maps the life cycle of Maven with the dependency mechanism with import and export packages that we just described for OSGI. So if I just built this project, I'll say Indian install. Okay. I wait for a while. Downloading the internet. <laughs> okay, while well, this finishes, <coughs> oh, then, uh, I'll open up an OSGI console in Eclipse. I have a host OSGI console which opens the console that has installed all of the Eclipse bundles, or typically the bundles which are the Eclipse plugins. And from this console, I want to install my bundle first. I can ins just say install file slash slash slash, and I provide the path to the jar file of my bundle. I'll just replace some of the slashes here. Once I run this resolution, okay, so typically uh, I've installed my bundle, it, it gives me some bundle ID. In this example, this is 862. For example, if I say <coughs> SS and I search for my bundle, which is org. Something. I can see that this bundle is in state installed. So typically I've managed to successfully install my bundle, but it's not started yet. Uh, and it's actually not resolved by the OEJ runtime. If I say start and provide the bundle ID, which is 862, it starts the bundle and prints out the logic of the start method in my activator. So this is start the test bundle. Now if I look at the list of currently installed bundles, means actually that the OJ runtime has managed to activate successfully my bundle. From here I can also stop it by also providing the ID 
2, here you can see that my bundle is now stopped, and I can also install it completely from the runtime. So typically if you do SGI development, you might need to do this constantly while you develop your bundle. Unless you use some, for example, some provisioning tools from your ID such as Eclipse, IntelliJ and so on. Well, this was in general for SGI, just to give you an idea of what was the typical standard module system for Java for the past <coughs> 10 and more years. And, uh, yeah. What's the difference between installed and active state? I don't know that there's much of for SGI. When it's active, and what, it's, it's scalable by other modules? Or? So, uh, by installed, it means that the bundles is installed as a module inside our runtime. But it's not active. When you try to activate it, first the OSGI runtime tries to resolve any dependencies upon other modules. For example, if you have some missing dependencies specified in the import package of the module, then you will not be able to make it active or to resolve it. So active means also resolved. And that's why, so installation is just, for, for example, the runtime checks that you have a valid metadata, you don't have any types of uh, basic resolution errors, the structure of your bundle is fine and so on. And by starting it, this means that you are able to resolve other dependencies in the runtime currently. Okay, any other questions on OSGI? No? Okay, so now let's look at the more interesting part, and this is Project Jigsaw. So, one question comes into mind is, when we have a module system for Java that solves the class path problems that we have in general, or in particular the jar health problem, why, why shall we not have this module system as part of the JDK platform itself? So this is typically the purpose of Project Jigsaw, and when speaking actually of module IoT, we shall consider also the entire Java runtime, which is represented by the rt.jar file. So the rt.jar file is typically a monolithic file that contains uh, the sources of the Java runtime. And also, we can consider the JDK core libraries along with this rt.jar file when considering modules inside of the Java platform itself. So we want to have built-in support for OSGI OSGI-like modules in our Java platform. So the JDK is actually monolithic. We have more than 5,000 classes in our JDK installation. The, the RTJR file contains a number of native C classes that implement the Java virtual machine. And we want to split them in order to be, to be able to provide things such as easier maintainability, more security, uh, faster startup time, smaller memory footprint, and so on. And there was an effort in JDK 8 to prepare the platform for modularization. We had the so-called compact profiles, which are just reduced versions of the source code of the Java platform. So we have three compact profiles, and each of them contains different parts of the classes from the Java runtime and the JDK. We can actually compile our application against particular profile well, by using the command java c slash profile and specifying the name of the profile. For example, compact1, compact2, or compact3. So, and also from the OpenJDK build, you can execute make profiles to build images for the separate compact profiles. They are also provided as distributions on the Oracle website. So what these compact profiles give us is actually a reduced version of the JDK that provides a tunnel for easier splitting of the sources of the platform itself. And actually the project, the aim of Project Jigsaw is to provide module system for Java based on further splitting these compact profiles into smaller units or smaller modules. So typically, although Jigsaw has been deferred for several versions of Java now, and it's expected in version JDK 9, uh, as you can see, this additional effort for compact profiles is already present in JDK 8, and you can use it. So, modularization of the platform will actually change the mind of the Java developer. You'll have to start thinking in terms of developing modules in a similar manner as I already showed you in OSGI. So, 
once actually jigsaw is implemented, we'll, you'll have to start thinking in terms, of, in terms of modules and their dependencies instead of developing jar files and adding them as dependencies to your, for example, Maven form file. So typically draft three, version three of the jigsaw requirements state that typically when we have a modular version of our Java platform, typically all of the applications that are currently running upon standard APIs or making use of standard JDK classes should remain compatible. This means that, for example, if, you move, if, if our application moves to JDK 9, it should be running without any problems. But this is typically not the case with some applications that make use of internal APIs. For example, applications that use rt.jar. And think of such, a, of such applications that make use directly of the rt.jar file. Which? All of them. No, I mean directly loading the rt.jar file and inspecting it. For example, application servers. Also, Java IDs such as Eclipse, NetBeans, IntelliJ. It's been shown that, for example, Glassfish application server does not run uh, on a modular version of uh, JDK uh, due to this removal of rt.jar file. So what is exactly Project Jigsaw once we've mentioned that we want to modularize the platform? Typically, uh, Jigsaw will provide the basis of a Java module system Java specification request and currently the progress is based upon three separate JEPs or Java enhancement proposals. The first one defines the JDK modules or how to split the existing sources of the platform and the JDK into separate modules. And this module structure is defined in a XML file, a modules XML file inside of the open JDK repository. You can look it into it and see what are the different modules and how they are structured. The second part is JEP 201, which actually aims to split the structure of the sources based on the results of JEP 200. So we, we have this defined structure in JEP 200, and JEP 201 splits the source code of the Java platform. Uh, and JEP 220 restructures the built images that are a result of building the JDK platform. For example, if you clone the repository of OpenJDK, you can build a platform by just invoking make images, and it builds currently two images, one for Java Runtime Edition and one for JDK. And now, actually we'll have JEP 220, will restructure the build of these images to include libraries for our modules. So here is the structure of the source code. Uh, in the first one, you can see the old version. We have source, then we have share, or the name of the operating system, depending upon whether do we compile our JDK for Windows, Linux, and so on. So if we have source Windows, this means that inside of this folder we have classes that are specific for Windows installation of the Java platform. If we have share, this means that these are classes that are specific for all operating systems. Uh, then we have uh, classes for native, then we have the name of the package, and then we have some Java or C native C files. And now the new structure actually will split this monolithic directory into several directories, uh, one for each module. So the new structure will be source, then the name of the module, then again we will have share or the name of the operating system, and then we will have the package and the classes. So in the early phase of Project Jigsaw, to, back to two years ago, uh, in 2012, we already had an early access build of JDK 8 that provided us with a module version of uh, JDK 8. But typically it was decided that it was not able to resolve all of the requirements for a modular version of Java, and it was completely dropped a few months ago. So currently work has been done upon the three JEPs that we mentioned and we don't have yet a uh, finalized version of the module metadata, as for example we have for our OSGI bundles. So what was the result of this early phase of Jigsaw, which was running for about five or six years? So we had two images of JDK. One was with all of the modules installed in the Java platform, so the source code was split into modules, 
and they were installed inside of the platform. And the second image contained only the so-called java.base module, with, which contained only the core classes for the runtime, and a separate directory with modules that we can install on demand upon our JK installation. We also had a tool called JMod that allows us, allowed us to manage modules. It allowed us to install modules inside of the Java platform that we have running. It also allowed us to remove modules, to list the modules that are currently installed in our Java platform and so on. So what is a Jigsaw module then? So a Jigsaw module is just a collection of Java classes, li native libraries and some other resources. So typically it's, in, it's similar, for example, to a NoSJ module that also bundles these types of things and provides this metadata.mf file that describes the bundle. And inside of Jigsaw, the module structure is typically the same. We also have Java files, native libraries, uh, and also some metadata that describes the Jigsaw module. So typically, the main difference between Jigsaw and OSGI, as you've maybe noticed so far, is that OSGI resolves the dependencies between bundles at runtime. So as Mitt asked me a few minutes ago, when we install a bundle, it's in the installed state. But when we try to start it, then the OSGI runtime tries to resolve our import and export packages. And in Jigsaw, everything is resolved in terms of a specific class path for our modules. So when we compile our module, we have to specify another modules on our class path against which we want to compile. And if they are missing, uh, the module cannot be installed in the platform itself. So this is compile time resolution. Here is it how a module definition looks like in the early version of Jigsaw, which is now dropped. But just this is just a demonstration on how typically the metadata of a Jigsaw module may look like. So we have module, then the name of the module, which is org.bigjug, then we have add, and the version of the module. So in Jigsaw, we have versions that apply to modules and not versions that apply to packages, to Java packages, as we have in NoSGI. We also say that our module requires another module, which is called org.bigjug.b, and this module should be between versions two and three. Uh, in the second example, we also have a similar thing, but we specify that depend upon modules with some ranges of versions. For example, our module A depends upon module B, which must be version equal or greater than one, and upon module which is C, which should be less than version two. Uh, so typically module versions are defined in a similar manner as Debian packages. And the reasoning behind this is to allow a uh, developer to be able to install packages from the package manager of the particular operating system. And this is, of course, only for operating systems that have package management, such as, for example, Linux. Uh, here, for example, we say that our module depends upon another module, which is JDK Corba, and we say that this is an optional requirement, which means that even if this module is missing at compile time, it can be resolved or classes upon which we depend from it may be resolved at a later stage. So this is an optional dependency. We can also require that we depend locally upon another module. So typically each module inside, inside of our uh, Jigsaw JDK is being loaded in a separate class loader. So it has a separate namespace in a very similar manner as OSGI bundles are installed they're actually loaded using separate class loaders. But if we specify that we require a local module, which is org.bigject.b, this means that this B module is loaded by the same class loader as module A. Or you can think of this as a kind of a mixing, since the source code of module B is visible to the source code of module A. Uh, we can also say in a similar manner as in OSGI that our modules can export packages or even classes. In this case, we export one package and one class. And this means actually that all other modules that require or use our module may use either class sample or all of the 
classes that are in the samples package. So this class and this package are visible to the outside world. We can also specify that we, we want to allow only certain modules to use our own module. So in this case, we permit module B to use things from module A. This is uh, stated using the permit statement. And for example, if other module tries to use uh, the seminar package, it will fail because it's not permitted by module A. So this is one thing that has no equivalent in OSGI, but it's useful to provide more restricted domain of the dependencies of our module. Uh, so typically, we can also provide aliases for our module. So we can specify an equivalent name, which is uh, com.bigject.first, which is just an alias for com.bigject.a. So we can use either of the two names along with the particular version. What else? We can also specify a main class for our module. This is, this is similar in the manner as we specify main class in our uh, jar file metadata. Here, we can specify main class inside of our module metadata. And we can invoke this module by specifying Java minus M and the name of the module. This will invoke the main method of this class. Uh, we can also define views. So views inside of the module are particular domains our module can define. For example, we can have one view that allows one package to use, uh, one module to use, for example, things for our mod from our module. We can also have other views that define different permissions for different modules since our, inside of our system. We can also declare services in a similar manner, manner as we declare services in OSGI. So, for example, in this case, we say that we provide some service which is uh, specified under the test service interface and it has an implementation or is registered in the jigsaw registry using the test service IMPL class. So typically the implementation of services in the early access build of jigsaw was using the java.util.serviceloader class which is part of the JTK core platform and allows us to load services at runtime in a manner very similar to how declarative services work in OSGI. We also can specify that we require a service. For example, our module B can specify that he wants to use this test service. And in this case, uh, at runtime, we can use the implementation that we have registered from our other bundle. We can also specify that we can require a service optionally. Which, which means that this service may not be exposed by other bundle at compile time, but we can resolve it at a later stage using, for example, a class for name or some other type of dynamic class resolution. So one question that comes up to mind when seeing this structure of modules inside of Jigsaw is why just not adopt OSGI or at least the module layer of OSGI to split the Java platform into modules and to provide a mechanism to resolve dependencies between these modules. And here is what Mark Reinold, which is one of the chief architects of the platform, says. He says that typically it's the module layer is uh, targeted for uh, operation at runtime, since the OSGI runtime resolves dependencies at runtime, not compile time. And that's why it's not convenient for implementation inside of Jigsaw. And however, on the other front, here we have Peter Prince, which is one of the OSGI guys that has implemented large part or defined large part of the OSGI specification. He says that inside of the Java platform, we only need to provide version for our Java packages in order to be able to implement module system inside of Java. So one short demo on Jigsaw. I'll be using the early access build since I already mentioned that Jigsaw metadata definition is currently in progress. There is a fourth, yeah, question? Hmm. Okay, enough time. So uh, for the Jigsaw demo, uh, we have a pretty basic project, which is a Jigsaw module. We have uh, 
one module dash info dot java file that describes the structure of the module. As you can see, it does not compile because I haven't provided support for this early access build of Jigsaw. So my module exports one package which, which is com.bigjig.seminar. It also requires the JDK based module, which is module that comes from the Java platform. It also has a main class. Uh, inside of my main class, I have a pretty basic start main method which just prints hello jigsaw. And now if I want to compile this, in order to speed things up, I'll just use cheat sheet. So first, what I want to do actually is to list all of the sources in my project in a text file so that I will be able to compile them more easily with uh, Java C. I'll just say here slash s, uh, specify the directory of my project, and specify an output directory, which is the <coughs> output sources.txt. If I go to this file, I can see that it just lists all of the classes along with the module-info.java file, which provides the module metadata. Now let's compile this. I'll just say Java minus C. <coughs> now, in order to compile this, I must use a module version of uh, JDK. Uh, I have two versions here. One contains a JDK module image, which has my modules installed inside the JDK platform. As, as you can see, for example, I have a JDK.jaxp module. I also have JDK.jdbc module and so on. And also inside the bin folder of my uh, module of JDK, I, I have tools for management of these modules. I have tools for installation, removal of modules, and so on. So let me go to the bin folder of this module of JDK. Uh, so what I'll do here, I'll say jmod list. So jmod list just prints the names of the modules that are currently installed in my Java platform. As you can see, I have a number of modules. Uh, so what I also want to do is to compile the sources that I have extracted in this text file. I'll say Java C, and the specific thing about Java C here is that I'm specifying the so-called module path, <coughs> which is the location that stores my module, or the location that will contain my compiled module. If I go back to this directory and go inside, go inside it, I can see that I have my module dash uh, module dash info dot Java class uh, compiled. I also have my classes compiled. Okay, so now I've managed to build my Jigsaw module. Now I want to package it in a proper format for distribution. I can use another tool which is called jpackage, like this. I specify just uh, jpackage minus m, the directory of my module, then the format which is jmod format, and the name of the file. Okay, so let's run this. It takes a while. So my module is created inside of this directory. Uh, it's here, as you can see, it's this module, org.package at the name of the version .jmod. So this is a Jigsaw module I have just prepared. So in order to install this module, I can just say jmod, jmod install and the name of the module, which is org.package core version 1.1. Okay, it takes a while. If I now say, for example, jmod list, uh, I can see that my module should be installed in the name or dot jug. Not here. Let me try it one at once again. So I should go install. Use the wrong module. This is the one. Now, if, if I say jmod list, 
I can see that my module is now installed in my platform. So I don't need to include it in any class path. I can use uh, packages or classes that are exported from this module. In a similar manner, I can just evoke the main method of my module. I can say java minus m org dot bg, and it says hello jigsaw. I can also evoke, evoke the compiler as a module. I can say java min minus m, and the package that contains the main class of the compiler is jk dot java c, and it starts the java c compiler. Now I can just simply remove my module. I can say jmod remove and the name of the module. Without the extension. Okay, so now it should be removed. I'll say again jmod list and you don't see it anymore. Well, this was the short demo of Jigsaw. And as a final note for the presentation, we also have to provide a mechanism for interoperability between the two modular systems. The compile time Jigsaw, which modularizes the platform, and the runtime OSGI system. And this is the goal of Project Penrose, but this project is currently suspended since we have a separate structure for our uh, modules that will come up in a subsequent JEP inside of the Java platform. So when we expect Project Jigsaw, maybe never, or maybe in 2016, what you can do, you can contribute to Jigsaw. So, so you can follow the mailing list, and you can also clone the repository and try to build your own version of Jigsaw. So that's it, thank you. Any questions? <laughs> Okay, so if you have any questions, just come up to me and we'll discuss. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, so we have another five minutes break.